my check one two my check one two welcome back to the agostino zinger show guten morgen my name is agostino welcome back to the agostino zinger show episode number 107 with me your host agostino how you doing how you feeling wednesday wednesday what's up motherfuckers it's your boy agostino welcome back to the agostino zinger show Happy to be back in the hot seat recording all this nonsense. I sound like I'm one of those YouTubers, isn't it? What's going on, YouTube? It's me back again, right? That's super annoying, isn't it? What's up, YouTube? Everyone's got their little kitty kitty, their little fucking um intro. Oops, fucking, that was loud. Everyone's got their little intro that they do, isn't it? What's up, YouTube? Well, like, imagine someone spoke to you like that in real life, like, hey, what's going on? How are you? It's like, relax, man. Who gave you all the Adderall, brother? Take the fucking chill pill, have a pint, relax, and look out the window. Fucking hell. Annoying, isn't it? What's up? But I guess maybe that platform, YouTube, you know, I'm part of YouTube, I'm part of all that malarkey. I guess it has, um, a little, 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 little. It, it kind of caters for that kind of, um, um, kind of personality right that kind of um quote unquote it's kind of a fake outgoing in it because most of those people that are like that aren't usually like that in real life it's kind of like a, a camera persona right you kind of have to over exaggerate if anything you know what's funny right even though youtube is like the new medium and it's something for the new generation and kids are kind of redefining what entertainment industry is and they're being a real they're being the real kind of leaders of this new generation some of these kids on youtube these comedians and whatever are selling out arenas and whatever doing their stupid shows that don't aren't really that funny and old comedians are be bemoaning it but if you think about their approach online it's quite traditional right they over exaggerate who they are in order to gain laughs right they um they do these premises you know those things that you see on vimeo like on, on sorry on vine or whatever or on instagram like um those kind of joke sketches like oh um when you're waiting for an uber and your girl's got a big bum oh uh, and it doesn't stop or you know like oh when when you're walking down the street with your girl with the big tits and a guy stares at them, dun dun dun. You know that kind of stupid sketch comedy, like ridiculous, like mind-numbingly uh, basic uh, beige avocado, like beige fucking avocado and toast, boring shit that people do. But if you think about it, it's quite traditional in the respect that how they turn it up a notch when they're in front of a camera. Right when really the whole point of podcast, the whole point of YouTube, the whole point of uh, social media, in some respects, is to just be yourself authentically. Right? If you're into if you're into uh, collecting every single Ed Sheeran album, right, or every single Ed Sheeran piece of me memorabilia, um, the whole point of social media is that you can share that with people who share the similar interests, regardless of how niche or dorky it is. You've got people out there who are into the same thing that you're into and you can just be yourself 100% right because back in the day you had to lie right you had to pretend because that, that, that's my theory again I've got these weird fucking theories that I think about things that just come cross my mind when I'm uh contemplating whether or not I should jump off the side of a building or whether or not I should pursue this career that I'm trying to <laughs> establish but one thing that kind of crossed my mind that I'm thinking about being 31 years of age right or being in this generation between let's say 87 and 92 I've noticed right there's been uh, over the years i've seen a considerable drop in the amount of people that i call friends who happen to be male or who identify as male who do not watch football i've seen a considerable drop over the years like um and when i mean watch football i mean you know post about football stuff on social media uh wanting to go and watch um, um games that aren't finals that are not semi-finals outside of that because you know anyone can go watch a world cup final but people that actually want to watch a league cup game people that want to watch a premier league game people that want to watch foreign football uh, in a pub somewhere um i have noticed a massive dip a massive massive dip in friends or people that i know who post about football related things and my theory is that when we were all younger, because we didn't have social media, because we didn't have the internet as we know it now, right? We had to all pretend that we liked stuff in order to just have friends, right? In order to be outside because, you know, back in the day or when when I was younger, for the most part, even when the internet was around, there was still a big onus in going out and playing, right? And having some time outside socially. It wasn't all to do with your smartphone. Now you could spend, you know, I'm, I'm assuming like I'm not in the minority here. Me and a brunette spend a lot of time at home. But I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people do that thing where they wake up in the morning, they scan through their social media feed on their phone. You know, everything has to do with the phone, like watching a video clip, going on Twitter, going on Facebook, everything has to do with your phone. 
But back in the day, it wasn't necessarily about that. You had to kind of like go outside in order to kind of have some fun, right? It's weird. It's weird to kind of uh, compute it in your head and figure it out. But there was a time where you had to go outside to have fun. So back in those days, in order to go outside to have fun, there were only, there was only um, a set amount of things that you could do, right? There wasn't a, a plethora of options. There was only a certain amount of things you could do, you know, maybe play in the park, maybe go chase some, chase some girls, literally go and chase after girls, right? Because that was back in the era when girls didn't know that they liked you. You didn't know that you liked them, but you just had this constant urge to run after them, right? Full pelt, like you were going to, I don't know, um, mount them on their back and maybe gnaw at their neck or something, right? Really, really strange how guys operate in that regard but you have to go you go outside and chase girls you go outside maybe buy sugary sweets and get yourself um jacked up on fucking cola bottles or go and play some sort of sport right and you are limited in the sports too because if the people around you like basketball you would just play basketball if they like to play cricket you have to play cricket if it was football you had to play football so i think back in those days because we didn't have that much options people just had to play football or pretend they liked it or oh yeah come around my house and play fifa come around my house and play football and now it's funny that if you think about it, how many people that you know who play FIFA but don't watch football? Quite a few, right? They exist out there. People who play FIFA or play football manager but do not watch football. It's nuts to think about it, but it exists. Because I remember there was a period in time, um, especially a lot of my little brother's friends, right, um, who are heavy into football, who are trying to make it, who are trying to become professional footballers. Some of them did come become semi-professional. Some of them didn't become semi-professional. But for the majority of those kids who played football Monday to Sunday, consistently, right, Monday to Friday, they played in the cage. Saturday, they played for a men's team. Sunday, they played for a men's team, right? They consistently played football. Most of those guys didn't watch football because um, when, you, when I got speaking to them, because again, I, I didn't know this existed because I, I didn't play to that level, that high of a level. I just played recreational, right? I didn't play prof like semi-professional level. But when I spoke to them, I said, oh, how come you guys don't watch football? They told me that we play so much football during the week. The last thing we want to do is sit down and watch more football. Now, there were those, there was a small minority of people in that group who kind of like to watch football, but they like to watch it only to kind of like analyze tape. Like for instance, like they do in NFL, where they'd go and they'd go watch a game and focus on a player who they kind of want to emulate, right? And and see how they move, see how they control the ball, see how they call for the ball, how they use space, how they tackle. That's what they wanted to do. They didn't watch it for the game. They didn't watch it because I support Chelsea, I support United. They watched it because they just wanted to follow that player and kind of glean some tips and tricks that they could then apply to their match on Saturday and Sunday, which is interesting, right? But I've long thought that that was kind of an interesting thing to see nowadays at 31 years of age. I can count on one hand the friends I have who I would I could invite to go out and watch football or play football with. And I know it's, it's a thing that only happened recently because, you know, you you grow up, you start to realize that you don't need to pretend to be anybody anymore. And you get other interests and you have other things that replace the football, such as going out and drinking, such as going out and taking drugs, such as going out and going to an art gallery, such as going out and meeting friends, such as going out on a holiday. Other things replace it or just having a girlfriend, having a boyfriend or, I don't know, moving in with people. Like things take up your time and all of a sudden you realise, oh, actually, I don't have it. And also another thing as well, which is, which is finally kind of funny, TV. Even though it doesn't make any sense, I think my lack of TV d definitely contributed to the rise in the amount of football I'm watching. And I think the opposite is true for people that don't watch football. For me, the thing that I liked about football was watching other leagues, right? I grew up um, in a household where we had an illegal satellite television, right? Um, some kind of fucking dodgy thing that you got of some uncle in a corner shop somewhere, right? That he'd kind of fit... Um, that he'd kind of use, he kind of install it using one screwdriver. You can never trust a guy that's going to come fit electronic equipment in your house using only one screwdriver, right? There's something a bit dodgy about that, right? It does, the screwdriver, and this is one, this is not one of those multi-head screwdrivers with a magnet thing, with a magnet head that you can change. No, this is just one screwdriver that he used in order to kind of um, install our satellite system. So I remember um, we had, when we had this old school satellite system or there was dodgy kind of satellite system that allowed you to watch everything, one of the best things about it was that you could watch porn, right? Like, you know those old school German porn channels that what, let, let you watch, like, old, like, adult movies, they were called. They were actually adult movies. Like, do you remember this thing called Fanny Hill? It was like a really, cr like, cringy kind of porno movie thing from the 70s that used to, that used to, what, they used to come on sometimes late at night at Channel 5. Do you remember Channel 5 used to have this segment where they would show really racy movies that involved romping, as, like, the Daily Tabloids, as they call it, uh, or bonking, you know, that kind of replaced sex, which is always funny, that phrase, isn't it? Romping and bonking. Just say sex, man. We know it means fucking. Like, come on, man. We're all grown-ups here. Um, anyway, so when they installed that um, illegal satellite um, system in our house, 
that kind of was what spurned my love for football, right? Especially foreign football, because I got to watch the Serie A, Bundesliga, uh, the League A in France. I got to watch some of the Brazilian League, right? I got to watch football from all around the world, and it really, really stoked my fires of football. Because I used to always be into football manager. I used to collect football magazines. I've always been kind of a bit of a continental football fan um, in, in heart. Plus, you know... Um, with the, what's that Serie A program on Channel 4 that used to come on, right? Uh, Football Italia. I used to love all that shit, right? With um, James Robinson, right? So I was really into it. So if anything, the lack of TV has maybe increased my watching, my watch time for football because now with the rise of online streaming, it's illegal streaming in some respects and sometimes i've got um i've got a bt sport uh, subscription here because we have bt internet at home so i've got a sports subscription where i can watch um football and ufc and all that stuff on my laptop um it's made me more i i i i, I watch more football now because i have more access to it right because everything's at my fingertips but i'm sure the opposite is true of other people right because they don't have a tv there is no um, urge to then watch football because they have to go out their way to go and stream it, find a stream. They don't, they do not they wouldn't even know where to start, right? Um, which is interesting. I, I, I don't know. I just realised it just lately. Like I think maybe because of watching um, Inter Milan versus uh, Tottenham the other day, or uh, I kind of realised, you know, there's not many people that actually watch football or talking about. It. I didn't really see anything on social. It's all just like you know the standard thing of like when Chelsea play, when Liverpool play, when United play. Everyone's kind of talking, but no one's actually watching football. Like football fans, like it's really really strange. Anyway, that being said, fuck Tottenham, and I'm happy they lost the other day. But um, I'm also happy to see um, the, that the media are not as spineless. And as agenda driven as I hoped they would be, right? Or as I envisioned they would be. Um, as you are aware, there's been a weird kind of battle going on re- behind with some United fans and some section of the media, right? Some United fans feel like they're being unfairly treated by the media, which is nothing new, right? I think we should all kind of like pull our big boy pants up and get over it. We're United, one of the biggest clubs in the world, one of the biggest clubs in England, if not the biggest club, right? Um, we've, we've um, for 20 plus years, we had a manager, Sir Alex Ferguson, who was notorious, right, for belittling and ridiculing and taking the piss out of journalists, right? So... The, the the moment in time that we suddenly decided to go through a bad patch like we have the last few years, right? It was only natural that the media figures and the journalists or the people in that in that kind of space were going to take the opportunity to kind of, you know, throw stones, to laugh, to poke and pro, to agitate. It's fine. It's all fair game. I think, you know, Sir Ferguson is taking a piss, right? If we're singing songs about we're, we're united, we could do what we want, right? If we're winning everything and we're gloating in front of people's faces, it's okay that if we suddenly start losing and uh, people now want to take the piss out of us. I think that's p- totally fine. The only thing that I don't like about the whole situation is that some journalists are trying to pretend or trying to act like there isn't an agenda. It doesn't exist, right? That we're making it up. That's all in our head, right? Which is r- ridiculous. We all see it. We know how much Colin inches Man United stories come and command. We know even when Rain Rooney, even though some of the stuff he done was, some of the missteps he done towards the end, end of the career was, was self-inflicted, was self we know how much Colin inches uh, Rooney doing something wrong um, is going to get in comparison to Jack Wilshere doing something wrong. We know it, right? We know Man United has that kind of draw, unfortunately, right? Um, from some players, they can't handle it, such as Ben Foster, right? He's a good example. He came to United. Um, he couldn't really... Is it Ben Foster? I'm sure it's Ben Foster. He couldn't handle kind of the pressure. I remember him mentioning an interview, um, a really candid interview, I think when he went to West Brom, talking about how big the pressure was uh, playing for United, the week in, week out having to win, and he needed to go somewhere where it wasn't as um, highly pressured, which is which is kind of respectable to say, look, I couldn't handle it, and I left instead of like kind of throwing stones and kind of taking a piss out of the club when it's mostly to do with you. No issue whatsoever. But it's just the fact that the journalists want to pretend like it doesn't exist. Like, this is something that United fans are making up in their head. Oh, no, you guys are making it all up. Like, we say the same thing for every other manager. No, you don't. And I think the other subtext of the story, which is something that's very intriguing, very peculiar, is it seems like some sections of the media have just fallen out of love with Jose Mourinho. When he came into Chelsea off the back of uh, knocking United out of the Champions League and winning the Champions League with Porto, he was this young... Uh, charismatic, brash Portuguese uh, manager with an amazing golden tan that was kind of cocky and kind of knew what he was going to do in the game and how legendary he was, right? And for some reason, it captivated the English spirit. I don't know why, because generally as uh, British people, we're not very braggadocious or like upfront or like cocky about our thing. We're quite conservative, we're quite laid back. But for some reason, I think maybe we saw something that we long to be in Jose Mourinho, right? Someone very calm. Maybe kind of, maybe because it was in the era of Sven Goran Eriksson managing England and he was kind of meek and mild mannered. Someone as brash as uh, Mourinho, or maybe if we look into it 
conspiracy level theory, tin foil hat theory, right? Maybe because Charles Ferguson was so dominant during that era, um, journalists were just happy to have somebody who finally could challenge Charles Ferguson's throne. Right, remember Sir Spokesman said um, famously that he went to knock Liverpool off their perch. Maybe the journalists were happy to have Mourinho in their corner because he was finally going to knock John, uh, Mourinho off his perch. You know, because Sir Spokesman was notorious for banning journalists and some members of the press out from uh, press conferences because they were asking, in his opinion, stupid questions. So it seems as if the, some section of the media have fallen out of love with this Portuguese guy, right? And Jose Mourinho. Um, I don't know why. I don't know when it happened. I don't know if it was post Real Madrid when he kind of got shown up or he kind of had one of his biggest failures in terms of not being able to handle that dressing room, being kind of hounded out. I'm not sure whether or not it's because he came back to Chelsea and he was kind of, he cut a bit of a depressed, moody, kind of glum figure. I'm not sure when it happened, but there was a moment in time where suddenly no one liked Mourinho anymore. He kind of fell out of favour. He kind of fell out of vogue. He wasn't the style of choice at the moment, right? A lot of it might have to do with the changing climate of football. Um, now, you know, managers are kind of praised um, now more so for having a team that passes from the back, right? I remember there was a time, Roberto Martinez can probably say, um, attest to this when he used to be the manager of Everton or even at Wigan before that. I remember there was a time where even I would say, I was saying it during time, I, I got annoyed at Roberto Martinez because he insisted on playing tiki-taka football with a Wigan side who were clearly incapable of doing it. He didn't have the players that could do it. And that's one thing that's always kind of annoyed me about some man managers. I know some I know some, some managers, they're going to say, you know, what's the point of me managing a side if I'm not going to do it my way? But I think there's some managers who have this um, hell-bent idea on playing exactly the way, the way they want to play the game, regardless of who they have um, at their disposal. I think there is has to be a, a, a balance in that between your style of play, your vision, and also the players you have in your in your team. Same with a company, right? You can't be expecting um, A-star results if you hire B-star employees. It just doesn't make any sense. It's unfair to the, the employees, it's unfair to the company, and you're going to stress yourself out. <coughs> so I used to get annoyed by Martinez doing that with Wigan, right? He used to try and get his team to play out from the back. They'd concede stupid goals. But somehow he kind of lured himself because he was trying to at least kind of forward the footballing culture, footballing language of Wigan, whatever. But now you're seeing a real big culture shift in a lot of pundits, a lot of players, a lot of people and analysts talking about past completion, talking about the amount of possession a team has, glorifying these kind of things, right? Things that before weren't really necessarily looked at as a good thing, right? People are like, oh, what's this possession thing about? Who gives a shit? But I think with a, I think with Spain winning so many European Cups and World Cups, I think with France dominating as of late recently with their pragmatic approach, I think, and with the Champions League runs of certain clubs uh, like Real Madrid, I think the penny has finally dropped with some pundits and some journalists that maybe just maybe although the premier league is one of the richest clubs in the richest leagues in the world we might we maybe don't have the best footballing sides in the world at the moment right or at that time we don't have the best footballing sides, right we're not able to compete with the best of the best right in terms of playing style and then what and then when you look at it, you think okay why is that some of it has to do with the talent, but a lot of it has to do with the direction the clubs are taking, right? So it's to do with the chairman, the football director, the chief executive. What do they want? What blueprint are they trying to follow? If they, if it's, to, if it's to stay in, up in the league and just get promotion and make sure that they're in the league so they can get their um, Premier League bonus or their promotion bonus, then it's a different thing. But if it's about attracting great players, if it's about playing really attractive football, expansive football, then Mourinho, unfortunately, isn't going to be loved by the pundits because he doesn't do that. Um, by his very nature, he's a very pragmatic, uh, very tactical-based manager who kind of, uh, you know, um, favours winning at all costs as opposed to winning with flair and panache. If we can win with flair and panache, he can do that. I think he's proved that with Inter Milan. But if we, if May United can just grind out results, then he will do that too. So I think... All those factors converge at the same time, right? Mourinho's power is kind of waning. Uh, the Premier League uh, now kind of realising overall that they need to kind of shift their focus from just surviving in the league and maybe playing attractive football and making more, which inevitably brings more people through the gates, which then brings more money to the club, people buy more merch. And then the rise of these managers like Jurgen Klopp, uh, like the guy at Watford, um, like obviously Pep Guardiola, like Sari at Chelsea, people that play expansive football have now kind of um, shown how pragmatic Mourinho was. Because before, I don't think anyone realized how pragmatic Mourinho was, because there wasn't that many teams in the Premier League playing the way Man City do. But now there's quite a few. There's probably six teams that play that kind of style of football, right? Uh, Possession-based football, uh, wing back stretching the entire field. Um, 
um, what you call it, false number nines everywhere, no conventional centre forward, like it, people interchanging positions, little triangles in passing and movements. Like it, it's again. So, but I'm happy to see that the pundits are going back to my original point that so the the media aren't as spineless as I thought they'll be because now they're suddenly jumping on the back of um, Pep, uh, of um, Mauricio Pochettino, the Tottenham manager, and kind of uh, saying that you know he didn't. Um, kind of questioning his selection pro policy, right? Which is ironic, you know, considering most of these kind of journalists and pundits, you know, wouldn't have a clue what they were going to do if they were managing a side in general. But I'm happy to see there's some sort of consistency, right? I'm not happy that he's getting, you know, I'm not happy that he has to explain himself to a bunch of fat journalists, but I'm happy that they're kind of like, there's some consistency into it. So, um, here's an article I'm going to get up on the screen, but I'll read it to you guys listening. So it says as follows. Um... Pochettino angry at media for the disrespect after Champions League loss, right? Imagine, disrespect from Pochettino. This is the same, imagine, right? I'm happy that the, the, the darling of the media is finally getting grilled. He's talking about disrespect. Do you remember when everyone was kind of uh, taking a piss at Mourinho and he was saying, have some respect, right? Don't question me like I'm some dim-dum. You know what I mean? I've actually won Premier League titles. You do know that, you know what I mean? Because this was back in the day. Do you remember how... Wenger only started getting criticised about his footballing legacy or his decision making maybe in the last three or four seasons before he left. Before that, everyone was kind of blissfully unaware, right? Allowing him to get away with anything. But Pacino had won nothing. Nothing. He's won nothing. Yeah, he was getting away with it scot-free. Now I'm happy that he's kind of not getting pulled up on it, right? And cracking under the pressure as per usual. Mourinho Pochettino, it says, um, he accused journalists of disrespect after Tottenham began a Champions League campaign with a 2-0 defeat, 2-1 defeat at Inter Milan. Um... An Argentina manager took issue with being asked about leaving Kieran Trippier and Toby Alderweid at home, which was a very weird decision, right? Kieran Trippier is probably one of their standout um, right backs at the moment, even with Sergio Uria being one, you know, someone that is obviously going to be um, a starter for some team. I don't know who, some top four team in the future. He's too good to be sitting on the bench. And Toby Alderweid, a player who may now kind of looking at the whole entire summer, who's kind of had his injury problems, but has started off the season really well. So it's strange that he left them out. But I don't know why. Maybe there was a discipline issue. Maybe it was something to do with training he didn't like. Maybe there was an attitude issue after the United, after the loss. Uh, not against United. Who did they lose against? They lost against someone over the weekend. So some, he must have saw something that he kind of made him change his mind. Against Watford and against Liverpool, they were on the pitch, he says, right? Wow, what a question. Such an easy question. It's easy to talk about the players that aren't here. I think we need to talk about football. Because you know I think you forced me to say something that is not good. You disrespect the players that show better qualities than the opponent. All right. And he says, uh, what's, what's it says? He continues here. Warming to his theme of post-match media conference, Pacino demanded, why disrespect the players that aren't on the pitch? You can blame me and say, Gaffer, you were, you, you were so, so rubbish in your selection and the starting 11. But please don't disrespect the players who are playing because it's my decision. Kieran Trippier and Toby Alderweed, we have 25 players. And you believe that sometimes you, you behave like you asked me with your question that you can play only 11. And the other 13 players are rubbish. Sorry, but I'm, not, I'm so disappointed because I'm a person that respects you a lot and the players. When my decision is to play 11, you must respect my decision because I am the manager. Of course. I don't understand. Sorry. It's so painful to hear when, someone, when some people are not here and you judge in, in that way and you kill players who give their best, which is un absolutely true, right? <coughs> but it's also funny. You know, to see him finally, you know, getting called up on it. But I wish there'll be more, there's more kind of footballing based questions around that kind of thing, right? Or just in general about tactics in general. Because I think it must be annoying for a manager when you lose a game and, and, and the first question at press conferences are, why didn't you pick those players that weren't around? As if that was a reason why you lost, right? Two players, come on, like... That's not the reason why he lost, right? Uh, Tottenham were winning 1-0 uh, um, until the 80th minute. And then a lapse in concentration. They allowed a ball to fall um, outside the box to Mario Cardi. Mario Cardi, one of the most deadliest strikers in European football, if not the Serie A, who kind of rifled the shot in the bottom corner. And then from a set piece, they let one of their defenders kind of head the ball into the net, right? That kind of sleeping on set pieces. So it was a comedy of errors that led to them losing the game. And again, Champions League football, you can't, you know... Um, it's a top level, it's top tier football. You can't sleep, you can't turn off. Premier League football, maybe you can get away with it, but you can't do it in the Champions League. The teams are just too good. Um, so there's there's more to analyse there as opposed to just saying, who, why didn't Toby Alderweed and Kieran Tipper play? Like, shut the fuck up. But again, you know, I, I, it makes headlines. Again, I clicked the link, so maybe they've, they've won in that regard. But, you know, I'm happy he's kind of getting some stick because it seemed like, you know, these guys were immune to getting any sort of criticism because, I don't know, because their teams played football from the back. Like, get out of here.
Anyway, onto some topics that I wanted to talk about, um, apart from Mojo Protino and Tottenham Hotspur. Number one, Sheck West is pissed that Kanye is not involved in his album. So this is the interesting thread that I saw pop up on a forum um, the other day, which I thought would be interesting to talk about. Um, I'm sure some of you are, are aware who Sheck West is. He's got a very big tune called Mo Bamba out at the moment that a lot of people are hyping up, that a lot of people are like, excited about. Um, I think LeBron James had him perform somewhere was it at his house or something like that or if i saw a video of check west performing with lebron james lebron james loved that kind of song right um dun, 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 dun. right that mo bamba song right so it's very very popular at the moment he's got another video out at the moment too that's really amazing um so he looks like some he looks like a kid that's got a lot of potential behind him right and he's i think signed a joint deal with uh, Cactus Jack Record, which is uh, Travis Scott record label, and also with Good Music, which is, you know, Kanye West's and Pusha T's kind of uh, imprint. So he's got a bright future ahead of him. He's kind of linked up with all the fashion people. You know, he's in that kind of crew. He performed, I think, at, uh, I'm going to say the Governor's Ball, uh, wearing those, um, con what do you call it, those mechanic gloves, those Louis Vuitton mechanic gloves that Virgil did for Louis Vuitton men's. So he's, 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 um, he's, everything is set up for him to kind of do the best that he can do, right? He's got the record store, he's got the record backing or the record industry backing. He's got the backing of the industry in overall. He's got the right labels behind him. He's got all the streetwear and influencer friends because he's friends of all the spaghetti boys and all those kind of guys, right? So he's, he's right primed to stardom. But in his pre he's preparing an album that's due to come out very soon called Mud Boy. And recently, I think the other day, he went on a bit of a tweet storm complaining that he's upset that one of his idols and Kanye West, who he mentions a lot in interviews, isn't as, as involved in his album as he could have been, right? And he kind of details a lot in, the part, in a lot of the other tweets that he feels as if he's making the album on his own, that he hopes the album's going to be good, but he wished he had more support. Um, I'll read out some of the tweets and I'll get up on the screen now so you guys can kind of, and then I'll kind of talk about my kind of feelings because I think I've got a contrarian opinion on it. Even though, you know, Kanye's a genius, I think my opinion might be a bit different than a lot of people um, might be thinking about this. So Sheck West tweeted <coughs> the other day. I'll read it from the bottom going up. So um, Sheck West tweeted um, the other day, um, good morning. I wish Kanye was more involved in my career. I don't know what the fuck he's he getting into. Uh, fuck all adults was at this song, if any of you knew. I mean, like, I don't need anybody, though. I used to have, like, 30 kids at my shows. Mo Bamba was out last year. I never gave up on that song, Energy, which is true, right? It came out last year, and he's still aggressively performing everywhere, which is, you know, goes to show that he does have the right people around him in terms of A&R, in terms of, like, knowing how to circulate a track and kind of get it into the zeitgeist, because it feels like it's had a second wind. Right? Even though it came out last year, and it was a very popular track, and the video was incredible, it kind of has now a second wind now uh, since he's kind of given it another push. Um, the tweet continues. Uh, Mobile was out last year, and I never gave up on that song's energy. And I recorded my album Dolo. I just care. I just care about everybody, though. <clears throat> the, tweet, the, tweet, the tweet continues. Man, when Mud Boy comes out, then everything will make more sense. Man, I really used to go to every high school party in New York and play LeBron James or Sheck West two uh, uh, times back when I was sixteen. To be honest. Though I stay away and isolate myself, I haven't linked up um, your other people, your, your other fake people, because I'm not too genuine for fake relationships. And relationships and someone just wanting PC. I honestly just want Ye to be involved so I can give him the scouts like I already have. So, although I understand these frustrations, and I get it, if you're a kid, uh, um, <clears throat> let's say Sheck West is under 25, right? And you, get, and you get signed to Cactus Jack Records, right? Travis Scott is somebody you've obviously grown up with. Kanye West is obviously one of your idols, along with probably Kid Cudi and all those people, right? So to have the opportunity to be in the same room as Kanye West, to be in the same room as a Travis Scott, um, get, I get it must be super, it must be overwhelming, right? And it also must feel super gratifying to know that you finally arrived and your heroes and have now become your peers, right? It's incredible feeling, I'm sure. I've not experienced it in any way, shape or form myself, but I, I can just imagine how it must feel to be geeking out over Kanye West productions and um, tunes and songs and songwriting, right? And also geeking out over the way Travis Scott approached his career from t the mixtape era to the album era, right? And seeing he's kind of glow up and to kind of be in the same room as these people and to, and to have them want to hear your music or to have, to have them want to um, have your have your input in their song that they're recording must be incredible but i also think there's something really special about somebody like sheck west who's under 25 right coming from that school right but also coming from an era or living in an era 
where DIY, where doing it by yourself, where uh, direct con to consumer culture, uh, where setting up a band camp or getting stuff up on Shopify, you can do that in an instant. This era is probably one of the best era at cultivating um, unique artists, right? We're kind of getting probably the most diverse and wide ranging um, inf um, musical um, kind of acts that we're, you know, outside of hip hop that you've probably seen in, in any generation, right? Because of access to the internet, access to different sort of records, inspirations, people are taking bits and bobs of everything, right? Kind of like remix culture, that book that came out ages ago, and they're kind of all funneling it back into their artwork. So we're getting some really amazing results from it. But I also think there's something very special about your first album, taking time to craft it, taking time to really hone your craft really um think about what you want to say how you want to present yourself out in the public and i think there was no one who there was no one who epitomized that better than um uh, xx excitation r.i.p right when um <clears throat> what's that song came out ah when whatever that song came out that was really hyped right he could have easily easily rid off the back of it right but instead the f his first project that he puts out after that song sounds sounds nothing like that song he put out previously Right. He completely switched the script because he wanted he wanted to show his range. He wanted to be able to display how talented he was to the public. Right. And he and he kind of like he kind of surprised everyone with that album that he put out. And I think with Sheck West, I think everyone's everyone's expecting like Mo Bamba on, on 12 tracks, right? On 12 to 14 tracks on his album. But he's going to end up surprising us, right? He's going to come out with a ballad. He's going to come out with something strange. I'm sure his influences are going to be something very eclectic. They're going to be something that's going to be very needed in the current culture, right? In the current zeitgeist. The fact that he's, the fact he doesn't have dreadlocks, so he doesn't have colorful hair, is already a win, right? He's already kind of like, you know, uh, broken the mold. He's kind of already forged his own lane. But I think there's something special about him doing this album on his own. Right. I think he's done so much already in his own. He's shown already so much creativity, so much uh, special talent that for him to bemoan the fact that Kanye West isn't involved in his album is probably the wrong thing to focus on. And if you're being a bit of a contrarian, if you're being a bit highly critical, you would say that Kanye West probably isn't at his best, isn't in his best musical um, iteration at the moment. Right. He's not at his full. He's not at his he's not at his, uh, he's not at the height of his powers at the moment. I'm sure he's going to get there eventually. He needs to kind of, he needs to kind of like um, warm up. He's sort of like a UFC fighter that hasn't fought in two and a half years. He's kind of got to get that ring rust off, right? You saw elements of a bit of genius in Ye, a bit of genius in Tiana Taylor's album, and a bit of genius in Kids See Ghosts. There was some genius sprinkled in, in there, but for the most part, it was quite inconsistent, right? Hasn't been that great. And then what happens? He drops that track with Lil Pump, and we see, ah, oh, there is, that genius does exist in Kanye West. It's there, but again, it's, it's not consistent enough. So we have to kind of, I think if you're a Sheck West, you have to be a bit cautious as to how much input you want from Kanye West anyway to begin with, right? He's not having his powers yet. And if anything, some could say, you just putting out your album as it is now, right? Um, with the influences that you have, doing the work that you have at the moment, you could in, 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 um, in, uh, inadvertently, that word, right? Inadvertently inspire Kanye. You can kind of reignite, reignite his fire because it's obvious at the moment Kanye is kind of more concentrated on his fashion and getting that kind of industry and getting his kind of Yeezy brand where it needs to be. It's a quote unquote billion dollar industry. Um, he's focusing on going back to Chicago and giving back to that community. There's a lot of things that are kind of on his mind. So I'm not surprised that the music isn't where it needs to be. Of course, you know, he's probably one of the best multitaskers in the world. But I do think at the moment, some of his best work is not, we're not seeing it in music. We're seeing it in fashion. We're seeing it in other kind of places. But the moment it kind of starts to level out a bit, we're going to see the best of Kanye. And I think he's going to see, he's going to be able to offer the most that he can to people or his best. At the moment, I just don't think he's going to be able to offer what he, what Sheck West thinks he's going to be able to offer to him right now at this moment in time. And like I said, for a debut album, I kind of just want to hear what Sheck West has to say. I kind of just want to hear him. I kind of want to, hear his vision right that's what i want to hear i don't want to hear his vision um through the lens or through the tint of sprinkled with a bit of travis scott and a bit of Kanye. that isn't what you kind of want you kind of want to hear what he has to say that's why pusha t works so well in good music right because you get pusha t you don't get a Kanye version of Pusha T. You get Pusha T given, you know, given some amazing tracks and amazing productions, but you get Pusha T given to hard and direct. So hopefully, hopefully he doesn't get too perturbed by it. But again, it's interesting to see what's happening with good music in general. Um, there is, it feels like there is a little bit of ill, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of turmoil in the camp, you know. I don't think Tiana Taylor was entirely happy with the way the album came out, um, considering how talented she is and considering how long she's teased fans. Um, 
um, about new music and then for it to finally come out and be the length that it is with some of the other tracks cut that we heard through snippets. Uh, I'm not sure if she's entirely happy, right, in her position overall in the current musical landscape. I know she's got her own core um, hardcore fan base that are going to follow regardless, but it seems that there's a bit of, you know, it's not where it should be at the current space and time. And maybe the stuff with Shaq West is a good indication of it, but again, I just don't think he needs to focus on that right now. I think he should focus on getting out his sound. Because I think he did, he's done what Designer didn't do, right? He's cultivated a fan base, right? Designer, uh, um, unfortunately, had kind of the curse of the of the one big hit single, right? Um, without actually having any fans. at the, You know, people liked the song, but didn't actually like him, it kind of felt like. And he didn't have an opportunity to do it. By that time, by the time he had the opportunity to do it, he was getting thrown money at him. He was getting thrown record deals. And he had to put an album to kind of fulfill that record deal contract. And now he's kind of suddenly got lost in the mud. And now he's kind of re-emerged as this kind of quote-unquote EDM act and a kind of similar sort of vein as Waka Flocka. So you kind of, I think he's done well to kind of not follow the same mistakes as a designer, but I also think he needs to kind of just make sure he just puts out his project the way he wants to do it. And hopefully um, through him pointing out this project, showing, showing his artistic flair, inadvertently Kanye will be like, oh shit, this guy's on my label, man. This guy's amazing. I remember Shrek West. This has got me fired up. I'm going to do this or I'm going to supply him with a few tracks for his next album, whatever it may be. But I really want to hear what he has to say going forward um what's next on the list that i thought was interesting joey diaz and john berthnell um interview oh i recommend you guys check this out um it's on uh, joey diaz's podcast um i don't know if you know who john berthnell is but he's kind of the guy that plays the punisher um on the netflix series so an amazing interesting actor um i kind of put it down just because he's so intense in the interview that I'm happy, I'm kind of happy to see that, that it kind of resonates in his character. And then he kind of said, you know, he kind of studied uh, uh, method acting in Russia, which he kind of, you know, he kind of doesn't like the term method acting, but you can kind of see that that makes sense because the Punisher, it seems like a real character. It seems like he's kind of drawing from some, from something inside of him, right? Because sometimes, I don't know, Sometimes can you you can probably get a goody two shoes to play an evil character, a villain, right? But I think it might be quite advantageous if you're a casting director or if you're the director itself to kind of cast somebody in a role of playing a villain who might have some darkness involved in them, right? Who might have gone to jail, who might have been in fights back in the day. Someone who can tap into some level of darkness, some level of malevolence, right? Can really play a good villain. And I think John Brefnell on this interview with Joey Diaz on the Joey Diaz podcast, which I'll link on the title below, you can kind of get that energy. And now, what other thing I also like is that is his relationship with Sean Carrigan, who's another actor and another stand-up comedian. I love the kind of bromance that goes in, that kind of got carried between them. And I also just love the fact that during the interview, um, they talk really enthusiastically about uh about sleeping on uh, on a sofa together, right? About sharing a sandwich, about um really struggling, like having each other's back when they're going out and fighting people and stuff. They really glorify, they really soak and bask in their come up story, in how hard it was to struggle in Hollywood to try and make it as an actor, try and make it as an entertainer. They're really happy to talk about um, how many scars and stripes that they, they've had for their journey. And it's super, super, super interesting to see, like, especially after what I spoke about the other day in terms of Hollywood love stories, you know? Like, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect between what people want now, what, what, where they see themselves and where they want to go, right? They don't see the in-between. They don't see the mud, right? They don't see the struggle, the dirt, what they have to claw and climb through in order to kind of get to their dream. They just want to get to the dream. Um, but sometimes the, most good, sometimes the dream isn't as satisfying as going through the mud, right? As figuring shit out, right? You've got rent to pay. You don't have to go and pay it. You sell this. You do that. You get a last minute job. You sign on as an extra. You, you know what I mean? Like you, you, you get you, you sign you sign a production deal for a new TV series that's going to air for a year. Then before it airs, it gets dropped, and you're back to square one. Like I don't think people realize that actually that journey is the best part of it. The actual success, you hear a lot of people say, again, I haven't reached any kind of success myself, but I, you hear too many people saying it for it not to be true. That once you get to the, once you get to the top of the mountain, you realize that it's not that big of a deal. Like, it's, yeah, it's, it's good. It's amazing not to worry about money, I'm sure. It's amazing to kind of set up your family for generations and generations to come. It's amazing to be able to take out your spouse for dinner and stuff. It's amazing to be able to buy a car, to buy whatever clothes you want or whatever material possessions. But the actual best part of that journey or of the, on the way to get there was the actual journey itself that struggle being not back a peg rejection success rejection success rejection success that constant to and fro is what actually makes um for a fulfilled life like knowing that you could do that 
and knowing that you could do go back again. You, I mean, how many successful people have you heard say the phrase, "Ah, oh, if if I'll be, I'd, I'd love it if everyone took it all away and I started again from zero, right? Knowing what they know now, especially with the internet uh, at their at their fingertips, like they'd love the opportunity to kind of prove that they could do it again. Because part of the enjoyment, part of the journey, was the fact that you were struggling. And this John Brethnell, I think you pronounce it, interview with Joey Diaz on, on the Church of What's Happening Right Now podcast is amazing. I highly employ you to go check it out. So if you watch the Punisher and you know who this actor is, he was in Sicario too and a few other things. But you'll know him when you see him. Like it's an amazing, amazing, amazing story, and you get you you understand why he's so intense in the Punisher and why he plays a really good Punisher in that series on Netflix. So I highly recommend you check that out. Next on the list, um, Irish of Fear and Count Dankula. Oh, I'm I'm sure you're aware of this story, right? So Count Dankula is that guy. Uh, I think he's a Scottish or British comedian. I'm not sure what it what it is. Like kind of like um satirist or kind of you know um on like kind of online online gaming like a twitch streamer personality i don't know what you kind of class him as i guess now he's kind of doing some stand-up he mentioned ari shafir podcast but can dracula was was a dude who um a few months ago um got his dog to do the high the, the, the high hitler sign right the kind of like raising your arm up in the air with your palm um with your palm kind of facing down um he kind of got his dog to do that on command right when he said hitler and then the guy the, the, the dog will do the high the high hitler sign right so it was really funny at the time, right? But of course, you know, in this whole PC era that we're living in, some people get, some people um, got offended by it, got pissed off, uh, demanded that he get deplatformed. You know, I don't know. He's a comedian on Twitter, but somehow I don't know how it happened. But I guess because it's, it, it might be deemed as anti-Semitic, what he done, and uh, he got arrested, right? He got arrested and put into prison over the fact that he was he filmed his dog doing the high Hitler sign. Now. Say what you want about the joke. It's in bad taste. It's something that someone should never do. It's disrespectful, blah, blah, blah. But someone shouldn't have to go to jail, right, for a joke. Especially a joke that isn't funny. That doesn't make any sense, right? It's not funny. Pull them up on it. Uh, tell them why it isn't funny. Dress them down. Publicly shame them. Cool. But allow them to continue with their lives. They shouldn't be put into a cell or to prison um, with rapists, um, armed robbers, murderers. It doesn't make any sense. But it happened to him, right? But the story itself is something a lot of people have not a lot, a lot of people have actually spoken about in detail. And luckily, Ari Shafir sat down with uh, Count Dracula for a, a kind of three hour long podcast when Ari Shafir visited um, the Edinburgh Fridge Festival, something that I kind of really would like to go to, um, and sat down with him and kind of detailed his entire story. I highly recommend you check it out. It's another really, really good interview. If you were kind of curious to find out why he went to prison, how it happened, um, how a joke that he kind of made on Instagram, I think, or something along those kind of lines, suddenly landed him into going to prison and suddenly fighting this fight for free speech. And now he's kind of got fined and he hasn't paid the fines on some legal battle. If you want to know all the ins and outs of that story, I highly recommend you check out Ari Shafir's podcast. Um, I'm not sure what episode it is. Oh, it's episode number 334 and Ari Shafir, uh, Skeptic Tank. It's on, you can find it on all the podcast apps, but I'm going to link it in the show notes so you can check it out as well. It's a really, 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 really interesting uh, podcast for you to check. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, have you guys seen about this Kavanaugh dude, right? I'm not, I'm not a big politics guy. I just kind of, you know, some, some themes kind of interest me. Um, but have you kind of seen the whole uh, Kavanaugh or Kavanaugh thing, right? Um... So, at the moment, there's a really big weird thing about um, this dude called Brett Kavanaugh, right? Who's kind of, who wants to be the, what does he want to be? He wants to be something, right? In, the, in American politics. But he's being accused by, uh, he's been accused by this young lady who's accusing him of sexual assault back when they were teenagers. I think now, Brett Kavanaugh is, how old is he? Um, he's how old? He is 53 years old, right? So he's been accused of something that happened in the 80s when he was a teenager by a lady who's kind of come forward and said that he sexually assaulted her, right? I think he kind of groped her and did something to her um, that, that wasn't very pleasant. And there's been a kind of big kind of hoopla about it in the media because the lady's come out and she's kind of wants to go on oath and say that this guy's a bad dude and this might kind of harm his chances to become, I think, the Supreme Court justice. But I'll read kind of a bit of the, the article here. I don't want to get super into politics about it, but it's just interesting case study of what's kind of happening nowadays in society, right? So... Republican leaders are preparing a controversial push to install Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court after a frantic night of legal political maneuvering in Washington that could uh, reverberate for years to come. In a major twist to his confirmation saga, attorneys for Christian Bailey Ford, who accused Kavanaugh of sexually assaulting her when they were teenagers in the 1980s, said her client was not prepared to testify in a public hearing offered by the Republican unless the FBI first investigated her allegations. Kavanaugh's category rejected the claims. 
Full's decision conveyed in a letter to Senate um, Judiciary Chairman Chuck Grazi in Iowa, obtained by Sina, raises a political stage for Republicans, however they choose to respond. Early signs are that the GOP will press on and try to get Kavanaugh confirmed, effectively bypassing Ford's demand for an investigation by arguing that they offered her the opportunity to testify and she did not take the chance to do it. The invitation on Monday still stands, says Grizzly. So, um, effectively, they're going to. So, effectively, this guy, Kavanaugh, is a, a Republican nominee, right, for the Supreme Court justice. And it seems as if the Democrats on the left don't want him to get a job because he has maybe some questionable politics, but also because this allegation came up that he assaulted this lady in the 1980s, right? So, so they kind of want an FBI investigation to take place about something that happened in the eighties. Uh, the Supreme, the kind of the GOP are kind of pushing back and saying, "Nah, we're not going to do that unless she testifies first. But she just doesn't want to testify, of course, because you know, test publicly testifying, you're going to uh, subject yourself to, you know, reliving that kind of really um, stressful experience, and your story might get ripped to shreds if it's got, especially if, it's, if there's any ounce of um, fabrication in it. I'm sure the defense will kind of find a way to kind of you know make you crack on the stand. So I'm, I'm, I understand her kind of reservations behind it but my question is which is something that i'm kind of kind of parlay into another dj topic right is when hmm how do you how do you phrase this hmm when is long enough right and like sexual assault is awful right i think we're all aware of that i don't think we need any more psas we don't need any more advertisements we don't need anyone screaming rape culture rape cult we live in a rape culture which we don't especially in the western world right um if you go to maybe south parts of saudi arabia parts of the middle east um parts of southeast asia you might find some sort of rape culture there right where women are suppressed where the patriarchy in this tyrannical form does exist but for the most part in western society we don't really have rape culture right and um, for the most part rape is still uh some it's, if you're a rapist you're still a social pariah it's something that is uh reviled and kind of like disgusting around most people right i'm not gonna gloat or pat you in the back even in even in the locker room boys are not gonna congratulate you for raping somebody right you'll probably get beaten up and rightfully so so we don't need any more reminders that that stuff is bad right but is there such a thing as making a mistake and if you do make a mistake are you accountable for that mistake until the end of time that's something i've just been thinking about a while because let's let's take away the politics right let's take strip that away strip away the names and let's just say somebody in their 50s right did some a heinous act right sexually assaulted somebody in the 80s now something really bad right they fucked up they were too drunk and they kind of like tried to make a move on a girl who they thought was complicit but she wasn't in that drunken heading hedonistic moment they could not hear no and they carried on until the girl kind of slapped them out of reality right start the person out of reality said, fuck off leave me alone right and all of a sudden you wow you realize the kind of the brevity of what you've done but at, by that time shame comes across you and you run away right and instead of going and apologizing to the girl you don't want to apologize because you're so ashamed you're so disgusted at what you've done you just run you move to another state you move somewhere else but unfortunately that girl has to live with that experience right she has to kind of relive that experience maybe over time she might learn to forgive you and might realize you know what it was an honest mistake that he done when he was young or she might just hold a grudge against you until the end of time right you don't know because you you decided to run away you didn't man up about it and apologize or see or, or kind of gone to the woman and 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 kind of try to figure out how you could kind of mend this or how you could kind of some kind of come to some sort of some kind of resolution but i think if you run away right from your issue and you feel ashamed and you and you're embarrassed by it and you don't want to face up to it should you still be accountable to this what you did when you were 18 at 53 <clears throat> especially if it's a sexual assault that did not lead to any sort of physical... Like, I can't say it. Can you say that? <clears throat> if it's a sexual assault that didn't lead to a rape, <clears throat> that didn't lead to something really disgusting and it didn't lead to any sort of like um, real... Not real. It didn't lead to any sort of like um, tan tangible uh, physical violation, right? Like, because there needs to be, there needs to be a, de there needs to be degrees of everything, right? Because manslaughter isn't the same as premeditated murder, right? That exists, right? You can't accidentally kill somebody, right? You can't unintentionally kill someone. It does happen. It happens all the time, right? Um, to like premeditated murder, like a serial killer going out, stoking, st uh, staking out someone's home and, you know, choosing the right time to go and bludgeon them to death. There should be a diff, there is a degree in that, right? So that degree of severity needs to exist in sexual assault, right? There needs to be, you know, touching someone's ass 
or making unwanted advances and sticking your um, penis inside of somebody with force, right? Without them wanting to do it, right? There, there needs to be a scale. I know it's crude to say it, but there has to be a scale that exists. And if that, and if that scale does exist, should you be held accountable for touching someone's bum when they didn't want to be touched back when you were 18, when you turned 53? Should you still be accountable for that? I say no. Should you be accountable for raping somebody when you were 18, but you got away with it and you're now 53? Yes, of course. Like, motherfucker, you're a rapist, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, lock away the key. Like, fuck off. Like, bury him under the, bury him under the prison. 100%. I agree with that. But I don't think uh, making unwanted moves, groping somebody, trying to kiss somebody and then rejecting you should be um, held in the same level of severity as molest um molesting or raping somebody now again i don't know the details of the case i don't know whether or not he did try and physically penetrate her he did try and kind of finger her or he did try and grab her boob or expose her boob or whatever or, ex or whatever i'm not sure if he did do something really demeaning that kind of stripped her of any sort of dignity or any sort of integrity something that she's been back because again i I would like to think a lot of women that came up, that come out and say these kind of things are not saying it for the attention. I'm not saying it because they want to be a quote unquote activist. I'm not saying it because they want to somehow um, be remembered in the history books as one of the people who contributed to the ultimate demise of Donald Trump, right? Because, you know, this guy is a GOP, is a Republican uh, nominee for the Supreme Court. So there is maybe that kind of time that people want to kind of play their part. It's sort of like what Stephen Colbert does, right? He's always, always talking about Donald Trump every single day, right? Because, you know, and he doesn't get tired of it because he somehow justifies in his head that he's a crusader, um, for the for the Democrats for the left, and he wants to be part of he wants to be part of the timeline of what brought down Trump, right? These constant uh, snipes at him, saying his mouth is like a cock holster for Vladimir Putin. He's really degrading things that are crazy. Because imagine somebody from the left, it's, imagine somebody from the right said about somebody from the left, like people would be going absolutely nuts. So they kind of say what they want about this guy. I'm not a fan of him at all. And I think that's that goes without saying. But you know, some of the things that they've said about this dude. You can't, it's not, you know, it's not surprising that there's all this muscling going around. So I'd like to think that some of these women's intentions are pure. That they said that, that she's coming up and saying this. I'm sure she's probably in the 50s too. She's saying this because she's seeing this guy, Kavanaugh, um, um, testifying in front of, um, in front of Congress, whatever, maybe that thing he's doing, right? And it's bring, it's kind of bringing back these memories, um, that she has of this kind of really, um, intense moment that she went through when she was 18 years old and it's really kind of like shaking her up and she can't handle it right so there is kind of a pure in intention there of like nah this guy got away with it for too long he needs to face some consequences of something that he'd done plus he didn't even apologize he didn't have he didn't even have the decency to apologize all these years about something that he knows has really hurt me because we have mutual friends and he's heard through the grapevine or whatever the fact that he hasn't apologized really pissed him off right that could be true but it's also a part of me that's kind of like I'd hate to think the thing, I'd hate to think, because again, my memory is so shit, right? I don't have the best memory in the world. Some, maybe some could argue it's intentional because I don't remember some of the fucked up shit that I've done. But in general, I don't really have a good memory, right? But I'd hate to, I'd hate to think that anything I did when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 will be held up as any kind of uh, barometer, as any kind of judge of who I am now, right? That somehow I'm a bad person because I tried to make a move on somebody when I was 18 and they didn't want, they didn't want it. And now at 53, I have to answer for it. That, that is fucked up in some respect. I don't know how it is, but it is. Again, if it's rape, if, if you accidentally, if you accidentally, if you rape somebody when you're 18, you're, you're probably accountable to that for the rest of your life, as you should be, right? But if you touch somebody up, or if you try to get a dance of a girl in the, in, in, the, in the Bashman rave and she didn't like it and, you know, the, your fucking erect teenage penis kind of rubbed up against a bum and she was like, ew, ran away. But then over time or over the years, it kind of came back and haunted her and something that was really troubling in her mind. I don't think you should be held up at the same sun. I don't think it should be treated as the same brevity as somebody forcefully in, inserting themselves in another girl. But I do think if the girl wants to kind of call you up on it or publicly shame you on the social media platforms, then no, then fair dues. But should she be, but should she be going to your employer and demanding that you get sacked? Probably not. But if she's your friend on social media or she knows that you have the same sort of friendship groups, <clears throat> she's well within her rights to publicly shame you. And I think that's fine. <clears throat> I think it's fine. There is a level of public shame that 
will get people to rehabilitate themselves, right? Or will get people to kind of acknowledge the wrongs that they've done or kind of fess up to their mistakes. But I don't think the right way to go about it is to um, make sure everyone loses everything they have over a, a mistake that happened, I don't know, 40, 30 years ago. That seems really crazy to me, in my opinion. Um, and it segues in very nicely. Um, again, I don't know what the issue is. It might be something that way above my intellect level. I haven't really read the details on it because, again, like I said, I'm not really into politics. But this segues really nicely into this issue happening at the moment with this DJ called Constantine. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the whole topic, right? But there's this DJ called Constantine, a techno DJ, who's kind of really suffering at the moment, right? He's kind of going through a real public battering. So, um, late, I think the other day, I think the other week or some sometime recently, especially during festival month, um, this DJ called Constantine was booked, a techno DJ was booked to play at ADE, right? A Dutch festival. And then um, straight away, um, loads of um, activist groups um, saying around protecting of women in nightlife, kind of like were protesting the decision and kind of hounding out the event booker and questioning why he booked um this constantine guy and the reason why it's driving so much con controversy is because um constantine i think sometime last year gave an interview where he displayed very misogynistic views um against women within the electronic or within the underground underground electronic dance scene right and he kind of said something along the lines of some during an interview with a german magazine that he thought uh women got an easier run at the game of djing than men did right especially if they're attractive he kind of felt as if like it wasn't a it wasn't an even playing field um some would some say he said it in kind of with a uh, tongue-in-cheek some say he said it um with malicious intent and then um as soon as the article came out people like black madonna and a few others detailed their experiences uh in person anecdotal as they may be but they detailed their own personal experiences with this constantine dude and supposedly uh, he had ex displayed uh, misogynistic views to them too right so I'm going to get some of the topic here to explain some of it, but it does kind of segue a lot into kind of what um, happened with this uh, Kavanaugh dude, kind of, right? La, la, la. So this is a top, this is an article on uh, Mixmag that I'm going to put up, put in the show notes too, so you can read it yourself. But the article is like um, entitled Love Island, Exp Love, Love Land Explains Decision to Book um, Constantine During ADE. Love Island's head booker Robert Deutsch has responded to an online petition calling for a removal of Constantine from the lineup of the three parties he has been booked to play at Dutch Capital during ADE, Amsterdam Dance Event. Constantine is set to play at a party Love Land is throwing in collaboration with Circo Loco in Amsterdam, spot uh, Media, Haven, Media Haven during ADE on October 20th. More than 700 people have signed a petition that has launched due to comments made by Constantine in an interview with German Groove magazine last year. In, in which he said um, women get undeserved levels of attention in the music industry. Speaking to Mix Mag on the phone, the booker who booked Constantine said, if these remarks are true, I, I don't stand behind them. I'm against them. It's a stupid thing to say, but it goes way too far to scrutinize somebody for the rest of their lives and boycott stuff. If you think the guy's a dick, then don't come to his shows. But we live in a society where we should talk to each other and persuade each other in and persuade each other in a normal open communication. We shouldn't be living in a society where we just come where we where just because someone says something, we'll all try to ruin someone's life. He also continues and says, I thought it was already a water under the bridge because it happened last year. This petition was a surprise to us. I don't think this will happen. This will help the conversation or the discussion in any way. Uh, la, la, uh, da, da. Uh, la, la. Um, and he stresses at the bottom of his statement the, the book of a love, love land that booked Constantine um, this happened 18 months ago I thought it was water under the bridge this was not this was a surprise to us I don't think it's going to help the conversation at all don't misquote me too like Constantine was the bottom line is that of course we are against any form of hate we are called love land for a reason hate doesn't have a place in our scene I think talking to people and discussing things openly especially at ADE which is a conference should be a good chance to discuss go up to him and ask his point of view he hasn't given us any reason apart from his interview which said I was out was out of context haven't seen any proof that says really um he has hatred against women in any way we shouldn't jump to conclusions so in the interest of clarity this is the article that he mentioned that women get an easier draw it's uh, i'm not sure if you will really be able to translate it says that women get an even what it says here oh you have to activate your ad blocker let me see if i can pause it for one moment on this website and see if i can run it pause on this site 
he said something along the lines of like he doesn't feel let me see if he was out of quote if he was quoted you know out of context because it might have been a joke right he might have just been like kiddingly about it like oh i wish i was a six foot two blonde female with big tits and i did you the way i did because i'll be far further ahead of life right it could be just one of those kind of jokes that you know didn't land that well especially if you're being interviewed by a quote-unquote feminist right um sometimes you can I, that, I made that mistake of making kind of like misogynistic kind of like quote-unquote jokes that would work with somebody else or maybe they wouldn't maybe they're kind of like distasteful but sometimes you need to read your audience right and you probably didn't read his audience but again i'm not sure because it's translated in german i don't sure if it's you'll be able to even to say it. um giggling fucked up on it what do you say women what do you say women anyway i don't know what is that you can't find an exact quote exactly but um the kind of it did the rounds right that this dude constantine was misogynistic and he kind of had these really um prehistoric or really uh, you know old school ideas of what you know he kind of he kind of prescribed to the idea that women weren't funny you know that whole comedian thing that came out when um uh, that kind of trope was being um spoken about in public now there has to be we have to have an honest conversation right about um music industry in general or the entertainment world and there needs to be an honest conversation that needs to exist in underground culture, right? But I think this t topic is interesting because what the booker says, I kind of agree by and large, right? I think, which goes back to the whole Kavanaugh issue, right? I think if he said something out of context or if he said something mean, so something distasteful, something that wasn't nice, something that hurt people's feelings last year, should he still be suffering? Should he still not be able to make a living this year? That's just like an easy question that someone could should be able to answer, right? If you do something bad, right? If you hurt someone's feelings, right? If you take the piss out of somebody, right? If you joke around with somebody who's not your friend and they don't take it the right way, right? Should you be held accountable for that for a year? Now, you could say yes if I don't apologize, right? Or if I continue to be a dick about something or if I act like I didn't do anything wrong, if I don't take your feelings into consideration, right? Because sometimes um, the only way you can risk the only way you can risk offense is by being open and having an open dialogue. But if I do offend you in some way, shape or form, you should be able to say, I guess, you know, that really hurt my feelings. Um, and I should be, and if I value the friendship or the, the relationship that we have, I should be man enough or I don't have to say, you know what? I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean that. But if it hurts your feelings, I am sorry because I want you to feel better about it. So I apologize. So if I do that, it should be okay. It should be one of the bridge. But if I don't do that, should you still hate me for a year? I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know how grudges work in that respect, right? Um, but if someone makes a mistake in the public eye, right, should they be held accountable for that for a year? Should they be not able to earn any money ever again? And what what deems an appropriate response? What is acceptable? What can people what are people OK with? What's going to be all right? What's going to make you feel better? Right. So if I'm Constantine, I said something deplorable, such as, you know, women get a far easier run at the entertainment industry or becoming a DJ than men do, which, you know, some could argue is true. Some could argue is not true. I would probably tend to side more along the lines of that. It's probably not true. I think everyone that's played in a bar, anyone that's played in a nightclub, but there's one person, anyone that's played at an art gallery where no one cares about if you're there and the table's too low and you have to bend your back and move around your controller, anyone that's played in shitty venues knows that that come up regardless of how hot you are or how good you are that come up is brutal it exists for everybody i'm sure for open 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 mic comedians or comedians in general doing open mic set exists right Be playing in a bar playing in a in a uh during someone's bar mitzvah where everyone's got their back to you where people are eating and shit people have to people have to wade through piles of shit in order to get to where they have to get to everyone does right some people might have a shorter journey because they are attractive which is you know we live in the entertainment industry by um if you live, if you're in the entertainment industry, you have to accept that there is some level of superficial um, qualities that are maybe rewarded in that respect because it's the entertainment industry. People do want to see nice things, you know, great lighting, great stage design, um, a DJ wearing a funny T-shirt, and it could extend to even looks or appearances, right? That can kind of play into it. It's not something that um, people should kind of act like doesn't exist, right? When Seth Troxler was kind of coming up during the beginnings, right? Some of the reason why he was very popular or someone people that really liked in the same sort of vein as Jack Master was because he was this larger-than-life character 
character who kind of dressed funny, right? Who kind of waved his arms around the air behind the booth, had a real cool look about him. That contributed to his um, overall star power. Now, it did help that he's an amazing crate digger. He's one of the best DJs that we have in the scene. But his overall package helped to kind of get him where he needs to get to. We can't ignore that. That's very much true. But to say categorically that women have it easier than men, it's quite stupid, right? Because I don't care how hot you are, right? DJing is DJing. Right? If you can't DJ, you can't DJ. And if you're DJing somebody somewhere and you happen to be hot, but you're shit, the crowd will dictate whether or not you get booked or not. Promoters, uh, bar managers, event bookers are very black and white. Did you bring enough? Did you bring people into the into the space? Were people enjoying their time in the space? Are people requesting you to come back into the space? If that's true, and you look like a gargoyle, you look like uh, Giselle, um, you look like Naomi Campbell, uh, you look like me, right? You look like a thumb. It doesn't matter. If you're able to bring people, if you're able to put bums on seats, and you're good at what you do, right? You will get booked again and again and again. Now. If you're very attractive, if you happen to be a Victoria's Secret model and you can DJ like Black Madonna or you can DJ as technically proficient as Dixon, right? You are obviously going to be get better opportunities than somebody else would. That's obvious. That's completely fine. I think that's something people have to kind of come to grips with and, and understand that that's okay. I've got some, I know some people, I've got friends. Some of them happen to be female who happen to be very attractive, very good looking women. I've said to them categorically, right? You are a very technically gifted DJ, but you also, you also, you also have to make an effort in some regard, right? To accentuate your beauty in order to kind of give your record playing um, the, the, the kind of panache it deserves, right? That extra little spice on top of it. Why not? You're an attractive girl and you're really fucking good at DJing. Use it. Now, I'm not saying to haul yourself out. I'm not saying to over-sexualize yourself, but it, it would be it would be remiss if you didn't somehow recognize what you have directly in your hands. It's kind of similar to some of these models who are activists, right? Who kind of champion charities, who kind of go to parts of Africa or parts of um, parts of the Middle East and kind of give back, right? They use they use the fact that they're a model. They use the fact that they have this platform in order to kind of ex in order to kind of preach their message, right? To kind of um, extend their platform, to raise their platform up in order to kind of reach more people. It's, uh, it makes it makes sense. People should do that. If you're famous, if you've got money, if you've got the resources and you want to do things, you should be able to tap into it in order to kind of further your message. If people call you a sellout, if people say you're subject, you're sexualizing yourself, they can go and fuck themselves. People don't know what's in your heart. Your, your intentions are pure. You know what you're doing. Um, you want to get further in your career. You want to put money in your bank. You want to feed your children. Do what you have to do. But I don't think what Constantine said, if he said what he said, is that crazy? But I also don't think what he said is right. I don't think women do get a further, uh, uh, an easier run of the game because I just think everyone has to go through the shit. Everyone has to go through the shit. But should he be suffering? Should he be not be able to earn a living forever because he did this? I don't think that's fair either. And then in response to this whole outrage, the, the people that are putting the petition up on the internet, people that were pissed that he was getting booked, uh, they writ they written an FAQ um, response, right? I'm assuming because, again, I don't know what's happening on social, but I'm assuming they were getting a lot of stick on social media uh, because they were kind of hounding somebody out that made a comment, you know, a year ago that was maybe taken out of context. That might have been a joke, might not have been a joke, whatever, right? So they kind of detailed this FAQ of their intentions of why they're kind of going after uh, Constantine, right? And it's fairly kind of straightforward. It, it's, I mean, they've got, some, they've got some points here that make some sense, right? So it says the following. <clears throat> um, don't welcome sexism at ADE, remove Constantine from the lineups, right? Frequently asked questions. Why target Constantine in particular? Constantine is a good example of sexism that is prevalent in the music industry. It's well documented in an interview with him alongside counter statements from promoters and DJs about their personal encounters with him. We know sexism isn't exclusive to him, nor to giggling, yet this is in the public eye. How we deal with this sets an example that people will remember. If we continue to let him perform, curate at festivals and hold showcases without his actions being um, adequately addressed, then we're sending a very clear message about how seriously we take sexism and subsequently how little we value women, which is fucking crazy. Right? That's loaded with so many presuppositions. Like, it's insane. But we're going to kind of run through it. Um, why do we think sexism is a problem in the industry? Oh, that sexism by male DJ makes the scene inaccessible and dangerous for women. 
Arguing that women are less talented, less capable, feeds into the women getting fewer opportunities, less pay, less visibility and space. Those claims that only the quality of music matters do not recognize or care that there are systematic barriers in place uh, which may, many of us face, leaving this instance of overt sexism unchecked as a broader impact on what is seen as acceptable level of respect to be given to women and other marginalized groups within the industry. Um, it continues, why this is necessary if he's already apologized? Constantine has done nothing in the way of public remorse, which is something we should kind of highlight there, right? When he shared his re quote unquote regret, it was not an apology, but merely an, uh, a means to defend, to deflect responsibility. In this case, he blamed the journalist for not understanding his sense of humor, which probably wasn't a good thing to do. Isn't, isn't this just hearsay? Is there any proof of his views? The problem with this question is that it's the, is that. The scene is not inclined to believe women and many people would rather discredit individuals that deal with large issues of sexism. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Is what he said true or not? It's not about discrediting women. Like, we should not, we shouldn't believe all women. We shouldn't believe all men. We shouldn't believe all dogs. We shouldn't believe all kids. Don't believe everyone, right? Believe them when they give you proof that you believe them. When they give you a reason to believe them. You shouldn't just believe somebody off the bat. People are fucking nuts, man. People make up the most horrendous shit. If you've worked in retail and you've sold someone an item on sale and you've clearly marked on a receipt that it's non-refundable and then they come back the next day and say they want to get a refund and they act like they didn't know you told them that and they act like they didn't see it on the receipt, that person's lying. Should I believe all women when she comes back and says that? Is that believe all women? What the fuck is this? Believe all women. Jesus Christ, don't believe anyone. Respect is earned. Belief is earned too. If you're constantly lying to me, well, we all knew that kid in school who used to lie about the games he had. Consistently lie about the computer games he had. Oh, I've got this, I've got that. I've got this game, I've got that game. Then whenever you tried to go around his house, you'd be like, oh, my mum's in. Oh, my mum's ill. Oh, I'm not allowed to come in. Oh, the house is a mess. There was always an excuse. Then you find out he didn't have anything. He just lied. He might have a reason to lie because he felt left out, but he lied. He lied. Kids lie, people lie, women lie, men lie, we all lie. Believe. Cuh. Anyway, it continues. We shouldn't need to debate whether or not Constantine is a sexist. Yes, we do. Just because someone, just because you've got anecdotal proof that he said bad things to women in the industry, again, anecdotal, we don't know if it's something that he carries widespread. We should do be able to debate something. We shouldn't be able to say, oh, because you said one thing, you insistently are that thing. Like, huh? There is, a simp there is simple proof of his views. The article was supported by testimonies from many people, including Black Madonna, Disco Woman, uh, Tal Kaiman, Kleiman, a promoter, and Olin, another DJ. So, four women have come up and said, you know, this guy's a bit of a shithead. Of oh, course. Cool. I take back what I said before. Maybe he is a shithead. Maybe he does have some, anti uh, uh, some really prehistoric views on women. Maybe he does have a problem with him. Maybe he was shafted when he was younger by a woman somehow. Or he's always felt as if he hasn't got the sex he needs to be because he's not pretty or whatever. Maybe he has got a problem with women. Cool. But not everyone is like this. He's just a fucking muppet. Of course. No worries. So, um, why do you think ADE AD is taking time, is, 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 why do you, and it continues, why do you think ADE is the time to take a stand? ADE is the world's largest festival and business conference of electronic music. It's also the city we live in. <clears throat> We're tired. Uh, we deal with sexism in the, in the music industry on a daily basis. We've spoken about countless times, but we are definitely not the first to be taking a stand against this and we're moving on from others' momentum. So, l largely, right, largely, I agree with some points in this um, in this FAQ, right, from the organizers of this protest against Constantine being removed from the ADE festival because I think um, ADE kind of, you know, de kind of tone deafly um, said that he's going to be part of a panel against... No, they're going to discuss... They're, there's going to be a panel to deal with, like, sexual, sexual, um, sexual assault or something along the lines of in the music industry. Constantine's going to be on a panel, which is really tone deaf and really in bad taste, right? Considering what he's been accused of, it doesn't make any sense of why he should be on that panel. It's not going to be... It's, there's no, no good will come of it, right? People are going to be on there and attacking him. He's going to be booed whenever he comes on the mic. It makes no sense, right? No, one's gonna, no one looks good in this situation. 
And if you read further, I, I read some um, tweets I found on on into, I mean on Twitter, and I found some other comments on some other Facebook pages that supposedly um, after this whole interview happened, where he said he does, he thinks women get a far easier run to be um, in the music industry than men did. He played um, in order to kind of make up and to kind of um, uh, fix his public image like an idiot. He decided to do a back to back set with some female somewhere in a festival somewhere, and obviously it you know it came across as fucking tone deaf as ADE putting him on a panel about sex sexual assault right or about i don't know um <laughs> what you call it um whatever that panel is on ade right it came across very tone deaf and you know devoid of any sort of humility or any sort of real sincerity and um, so much so that the people that are at that rave side throwing things at him when he was djing like not like not and so much so they had to stop his set like supposedly this happened right so he's been he's been a bit of a social pariah within the music industry for a while now he hasn't been able to make a living i'm assuming for a, or a consistent living for a good while and now he's kind of kind of coming up back from the parapet and kind of you know pulling the curtain back and trying to make a big run for it so if he said something bad last year should he be still be punished for it now i don't know is there an issue with women being represented in the music industry at the moment maybe maybe i don't know i don't think it's a categoric guess if it's a categoric no i think in the same fashion that I get annoyed, right? For instance, like, one man's one of my favorite DJs, technically, right? He's an amazing guy. I love what he does, right? But he doesn't half like a fucking throwback vintage set, right? I just saw him promote something recently the other day about taking it back to the 90s or taking it back to some sort of era, right? He's always kind of harking back to the old school garage, grime days. Every set he plays is stuff that, you know, was released 10, 12 years ago, right? It's never anything. It's never, it's not a lot of current shit. And that could be said for a lot of DJs who kind of play quote unquote urban music within the London scene, right? If you go to a hip hop club for the most part, uh, especially a scene to hip hop club, most of them play quite old songs, right? Old hip hop sets. Like you look at people like Living Proof, who've kind of made a bit of a pivot to contemporary stuff, but for the most part, most of it is like kind of harking back to the old school stuff because a lot of the people that are behind Living Proof have very strong opinions about the current state of music at the moment, right? So of course that will kind of extend to their DJ sets. But I have kind of been moan the fact that you can't sometimes go to a club and hear the things that you he are hearing on soundcloud hear the things that you're hearing on um hip-hop forums hear the things that you're hearing on spotify now there could be an argument to be said that some of that stuff only exists on the internet and people in real life don't actually listen to Lil uzi vert some people could actually say that and, and i don't agree with it but it could be true but there isn't there doesn't exist a space that 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 kind of music can kind of be played out loud um, from 9 to 2 a.m you have to kind of subject yourself to someone playing a tribe called Quest again and again and again. Same old shit, right? So if there's no, if, if, if I feel like there's not enough representation of uh, music as it is now, it's only, it's, it only makes sense to kind of extend that argument and say that maybe um, the populace who attends, music, who attends nightclubs, people that go in it, aren't necessarily reflected in the lineups of the club, right? Because by and large, a lot of DJs, uh like me for instance who kind of i dj in my spare time as a hobby um you start to dj because you go to nightclubs because you go out and have a good time and you start to be like oh wow this is amazing you connect to the music you connect with the performer or the person dj man and dex you're like oh I, I would love to do that that's how most people discover what they want to do right you sit down you watch uh, an eddie murphy um special for the first time in your life and you realize wow i'm the class clown i like to make people laugh this guy's doing it at a really high level i'd love to some someday do that right watching football whatever you some you need a, you need you need a you need direct experience of it you need to see it in real life in order for you to realize that maybe you could do it yourself so a lot of kind of that djing culture happens because people attend nightclubs right and if you go to a nightclub it's probably one of the most democratic places you'll see in the world especially if you go to one of the major nightclubs in berlin or in london or in places in barcelona right you'll see the world reflected in a nightclub right every color every creed every race every sexuality right um every sexual orientation like will exist in that kind of in that in that enclave of that of that safe space of a nightclub so in that sense of a nightclub, you're not going to get only dudes, you're not going to get only women, you're not going to get only straight people, you're not going to get only gay people. They're, everyone's going to, everyone across the kind of um, social um, and kind of uh, social and, you know, social hierarchy exists in that kind of melting pot. So it makes only sense that you should have a, a lineup that reflects that, right? But sometimes some promoters or some event organizers are quite lazy because they only pick the top 5% DJs who are going to guarantee a crowd. 
Now, it's lazy, but then also on the promoter side of it, they also have responsibility to make sure that they make money on the event and they're able to pay back their investors, they're able to pay back their staff, they're able to pay their debts. There is a real responsibility to make sure you make money or you at least break even. So sometimes it feels like you can't take the chance because you're not sure if people are going to come to an event where they don't know who the DJs are, right? which is why places like Berlin are really successful and do really well because they have the culture of the resident DJ that exists there, right? Where if you go to CDV, Club de Visionaire, you go to Prince Charles, you rarely go to those places because of the lineup. You go there because you know it's going to be a good time. It's a great club. Bergheim, Panorama, but being the same sort of thing. If the DJ happens to be great, amazing. Some people go to a Bergheim on Sunday morning blind. They just go and queue up because they just want to go out and stay until Monday morning. They don't care who's playing, right? So that happens quite often, right? So with that, you can take more chances with lineup, but mostly in London, there's kind of places like that. You don't really get that, right? In most, most European cities, people just go with the safe option. I want to book the, the top 10 DJs um, voted by DJ Mag or Mix Mag or Resident Advisor where they do their list, and then, you know, that's guaranteed. So because of that, some people suffer. Ma male DJs suffer who are really good, and female DJs suffer because they're really good. But I would imagine, by the most part of it, just because of the lifestyle that electronic music demands, right? Being away from your family, working um, unsociable hours, I would imagine. Again, just just from uh, just looking looking from the outside looking in, I would imagine there's probably less D there's probably less female DJs than male DJs. I'll just imagine, just because of the lifestyle um, that DJing kind of uh, requires, right? Staying up late. Um, Maybe, particip maybe partaking in a lot of drugs, a lot of drinking, a lot of socializing, being away from your family. Guys typically can maybe put up with it a lot easier than women can, by and large. Some women can do it anyway, but I'm just saying, by and large, it seems as if that might be the case. If that is the case, and there is, there is less women DJs than male DJs, right, just because of pure preference, right, then... And let's say promoters are lazy and they don't and they only book the top five percent DJs, whether they're male or female. It's only it only makes it's only logical that some people will get left behind. Some people will get left out and feel like they're not being represented, whether it's by race, color, creed, sexuality. They'll feel like they're not being represented, which is completely fine. But I think it's a bigger issue than just saying it's the promoter's fault. It's kind of we all are, we all kind of contribute to it, right? If I'm only going to print works because Nina Kravitz is playing. That isn't good, right? Because that means that if another female DJ plays who I don't know, I won't go, which would then hamper her chance of getting booked again because they'll notice the, the numbers going down. They'll see Nina Kravitz, but, uh, but uh, what do you call it, packed out the entire place, no queues going around the corner for four hours, and they'll see this no, this no name girl who's kind of really good but hasn't had, doesn't have the draw on Nina Kravitz. People didn't support her at all, and it was, and it was kind of empty. And they had to close the thing early because they couldn't um, pay for everyone that was working that day. So we kind of contribute to it. Um, by and large but it's a problem bigger than Constantine it's not just a Constantine issue it's something that kind of uh, runs deep within the entertainment industry overall which is why um, we see issues with kind of whitewashing in Hollywood right where there's an Asian movie or like The Last Samurai and they cast someone like Tom Cruise in it they kind of had to do that because um, by and large um, us the paying customer we've kind of shown them that we're only going to attend a movie when we know who the person is that's starring in it We've told them this, right? Um, inadvertently, through our actions, we've told them that we oh, we only give a shit if we know who that person is. If we don't know who that person is, we're not going to attend it. Which then hampers the chances of somebody else who's unknown being able to uh, is an unknown Asian actor who can kind of play that role to a T, taking that role. So it's kind of a bigger issue overall. I see what they're trying to get at. I see that sometimes a stand needs to be taken at it. But I do think they're kind of aiming their ire at the wrong person. And I think if this guy is a bit of a muppet and he has got some really um, prehistoric views on women and he does, he does subscribe to the whole idea that women find it easy because they have to wear a short skirt and just show their tits and then they can play the bird gang, he's a fucking idiot, right? He should be publicly shamed for it. He's a dum-dum. But should he lose his entire livelihood for, the, for his entire life because he didn't say sorry? I don't know. Maybe not. And why should you say sorry if he doesn't? If he doesn't? If he doesn't mean it, right? If he really doesn't mean it, and he really believes that he thinks if a woman puts on a short skirt and shows her cleavage that she's gonna get booked to the bird kind, if you think that's true b b before he does, then he's the one that's gonna lose out. I think people in the industry will realize that that guy's a do donut. It happens a lot in the movie industry, right? I heard a lot of people say in the movie, uh, some comedians say in the podcasting that if you if you've ever sat down and wondered, oh, where's so and so that used to be in movies? If you say that out loud, it's because that person's a dick, and people within the music, um, the movie industry business don't want to work with him, so they stop giving him opportunities. That's why you don't hear about these kind of people. So you so so even though we feel as if sometimes 
you know, some, some people, in the, especially women, sometimes feel as if people go unpunished for their actions. If you're a dick, by and large, you get your comeuppance. No one is safe, right? We've seen it with a guy from CNBC losing his job, Les Munev or something, right? So allegations came up. The Me Too movement has proved no one is safe, right? If you're a dick, you're going to get called out for it and you're going to lose your job. So by and large, it's been quite effective, right? The people that are dicks, the people that are taking the piss, the people that were horrible, that were treating people with, discon with contempt and were rude, they've all been kicked out, right? They've all been punished. It's happened. It's happened by and large, right? But I also think there has to exist this lane or this space for dicks like Constantine to exist where he can say stupid shit that no one agrees with and by and large his bookings just dry up and if he doesn't say sorry he doesn't get booked again forever but if he says sorry okay we welcome you back into the fold go and play go and dj again now i think that should be allowed there, there should be that kind of journey it exists but if he doesn't want to say sorry and he wants to risk his career for it because he generally thinks women get booked women get more bookings than him because they're just women which is a dumb idea then he should be allowed to brew in his stupidity and just not get booked anywhere because everyone's going to think he's a donut but let's not cancel him. Let's not silence him. Let's not throw shit at him when he's DJ. It makes no sense. Like the, like the promoter said for ADE, if you really don't agree with what he's, what, 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 what he's saying, I don't know, protest outside the club or maybe not protest outside the club. Let people enjoy it if they want to enjoy it, but just don't go to his show. I think that's fine. Just don't go to his show. Like, let's protest with our feet. Let's just make it, um, let it, let it hurt. Let them, let, let, let them feel the hurt in their pocket. It, a lot of a lot, I, I kind of say this a lot about football fans right they will bitch and moan about things that are happening in a boardroom but some of them won't stop going to games they won't stop buying merch but the only way that they're gonna listen to you is if you stop giving them money that's the only thing they care about if you keep complaining and waving your fucking 20 pound uh scars up in the air every time in the stadium it doesn't do anything you have to step away Sacri you have to sacrifice something like sacrifice, actual sacrifice, monetarily, reputation wise, whatever it may be, you have to sacrifice something in order to actually get what you need. But it doesn't require you, you know, shouting somebody down or deplatforming. I don't think that's actually a thing. I think societally we do that quite effectively anyway. If this guy's um set broadcasting these really stupid prehistoric views, then by and large no one's gonna go to shows. Gonna, this guy's an idiot. I'm not gonna go watch this guy play. He thinks cleavages are the reason why women get booked. Like fuck him. Which ones, do you know what I mean? It'll, it'll happen quite naturally. You just, you just wither and die over time. But if he apologizes too, he should be allowed to be welcome back into the fold. If he doesn't want to apologize, he should be able to talk, be told to fuck himself. But it's, it's, it, again, like I said, I think privileges exist in DJing and they exist in any sort of industry. They do exist. People lean into it, right? Some people who are, you know, come from a very rough background always talk about the rough background they come into because they know it kind of gives them a bit of an edge in an industry where everyone's a bit of a puritan or everyone came from a private school saying that you dropped out and you kind of learn on the streets can give you a, a bit of an edge, can give you a bit of an advantage over people. It's good. It's good to it's good to kind of use your whatever whatever kind of disadvantage or advantage that you have to further your career in some respects, right? Whether you're attractive, whether you come from a bad background, whether you have an interesting come up, whatever it may be. I'm sure Virgil, part of Virgil's kind of appeal of him DJing and the reason why he gets booked in a lot of places is because he's a designer for Off White. His own company is because he's a creative director for Louis Vuitton Men's because he has a collaboration with Nike. That helps. That adds to the appeal of him DJing. So to say that. If you're a big DJ and you're like, oh, Virgil's only going to get booked because he's got a brand. Yeah, that's true. As it should be. It's more interesting. It's more of a compelling story that he's got a, he's, 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 he's operating an 80, what, I don't know. Let's say um, he's operating two, three businesses, employing more than 80 people at a time, right? Whilst juggling uh, four collections a year. And he's also DJing all around the world. That should also add to his lot. That's actually a good thing. Like, if you're just a solo DJ guy who doesn't make records and just DJs, then you should, like, f like that's that's not as interesting as that story. I'm sorry. Make your story more interesting, but that isn't as interesting as that story. And that privilege, it's okay to use that advantage, lean into it. But I don't know, man. I don't know what's going to happen with Constantine, dude. He sounds like a, a, a total dick. If he was playing, I wouldn't go. And just vote with your feet, I think, in my opinion. But anyway, what do I know? I'm just a kid from Stratford trying to make it in the world. Anyway. I've been rambling on for way too long. That's in episode one, 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 one episode number 107, 107 of the Excellent Singer Show, I think. 107. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you guys once again. As always, to claim one free book credit, as well as a 30-day free, re, uh, 30 
free membership, please visit my link at audible.com for slash Aggie. That's audible.com for slash A double G G Y. Audible is a home of audiobooks. They have over 400,000 titles of audiobooks you can choose from. Some of the books are narrated by the authors themselves, so it really brings the books to life. So check that out at audible.com for slash Aggie. Audible.com for slash Aggie to claim one free book credit as well as a 30 day free trial. As always, you can check out my next DJ gigs at www. Agusnozinga.com. You can support me on Patreon and help me buy a beer, help me buy more better equipment at patreon.com for just Agostino. You can find a link at the bottom too. You can read my blog at defaultgoon.com and you can find me on my socials by visiting my website by visiting my website agusnozinga.com. You can find my Instagram, my Twitter, and all that malarkey. I'm not currently on Instagram, I'm not currently posting there. I haven't posted there in a couple of months, but you can find all my other stuff, all my other social links on there. And I will see you guys again, hopefully tomorrow, if not on Friday. Thanks for tuning in, the Agusnozinga Show. See you again very soon. Peace.